Okay. Um, let's just pray. May the words of my heart, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable into thy sight, O Lord. Um, amen. So, I was introduced to porn when I was in 10th grade. So, 10th grade, India, I was in India, I mean, I am from India, and academic pressure is really high back home. So, parents are always on the idea that you need academics to survive. And if you don't get good grades, you don't get a job, therefore you're home, and, you know, that's the life. And so, we are, like, as students going through high school, we were in this constant, it was like a machine. And that's how I describe school. As, like Everything was just academics. And therefore, we needed a way out. And the way out was porn. And, but, so, the, so I started engaging this in 10th grade. And then it went on. And it is a problem that I've been combating to the last few years, I would say. And the problem was, looking back, is I actively numbed my conscience. Like, I became a believer in, like, when I was 12. And I knew that walking in sexual sin is wrong, but still I engaged in it. And I actively said no to the voice of the Holy Spirit who kept saying, this is what you're doing and this is what you're wrong. What I should have done instead is when I was introduced to it, I should have fled from it. I should have chosen to flee when I was introduced to sin. Like me, some of you in this room might share the struggle in terms of struggling with sexual sin, not just porn, masturbation, any other form of sexual sin. Just for, just some stats for you. Uh, 40 million Americans are regular visitors to porn sites. And in the world today, porn generates $4.8 billion, of which 2.84 comes from just the USA. One in three women watch porn, and 70% of men aged 18 to 24 have been exposed to porn at some point in their life, and they have actively engaged in them. So, these are stats that say like, that are alarming to you, where you say you're looking at this and going, "This is so bad." All these people, and um, th this was the most interesting find that I had. The, can any of you guess which day is the most active for porn sites? Sunday. Exactly. Sunday. What? Sunday is the highest in, in terms of user engagement in porn sites, in terms of actively watching and consuming porn. And these are not just like free sites. People are paying money to watch these things. If only people chose to flee from their set, from their sit. I have a friend back home whose name is Sam, and Sam and I were colleagues in an organization that I worked at back home. So when Sam was in college, he was in, a, he was in an all-male all college, and when they were going on a field trip, the guys in the bus started to watch porn. They said, this is what we want to do, this is how we're going to relax. Sam chose to flee the situation. He left his seat and he walked all the way up to the front and he sat by the driver. The entire time, this was an 18 hour road trip that oh. Sam was taking. And these guys were consuming porn and the, in, the, in the bus. And back home in buses, we, like, we have screens, like TVs mounted in the, in the bus so that people can watch movies and stuff. And these guys were watching porn constantly. And Sam was right at the front where he could not see it, where he could not hear it. He was sitting by the driver the whole time while this entire road trip was going on. He chose to flee the scene. So for our text today, uh, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. So as you guys are turning in, I'll just give you context. So... Back in the day, Corinth was a popping place. It was on the. It was by Greece. It was. It had the mo It has the mo It had access to land routes. It had access to the Mediterranean Sea, and where there's sea, there's always trade. So there's booming. Like there's, there's just loaded with money. There's so many rich people there, and Julius Caesar had built. Corinth back for his old army 
generals who were retiring out of his army. And so this was like, the, this was almost like the Las Vegas back in the day, where you have the strip, you have so many, uh, so much leisure activities that you can engage with, and this was how Corinth was back in the day. And in Greek, there is a term called Corinthiosis, which means to employ a Corinthian girl. And to employ a Corinthian girl back in the day meant to hire a prostitute. And this was how this, this city was known for. The city was truly wicked. And Paul is in this city. And it is in Corinth where he wrote the letter of Romans, by the way. And so, and in Corinth, he's seeing all this treachery go on in terms of sexual sin. And so he writes to the Corinthians, when he writes to the Corinthians in a different place. The overarching purpose of the book of 1 Corinthians is to address arrogance and elevated view of self. So Paul is constantly humbling these guys and saying, you guys think you're so high, but you're not. You think you know your theology, you don't. This is how you're misappropriating it, using it wrongly, using it out of context. And this particular potion that I chose for my sermon today, chapter 6, 12 to 20, is interesting because it's a transitionary passage. It's If you read, if, if you read Corinthians from... One chapter one verse one to six chapter six verse eleven, he's calling out the people in the church. He's like name dropping them. In chapter five, when he talks about sexual immorality for the first time, he says, "How could you?" In chapter five, he says, "Tolerated even pagans for me, for a man has his father's wife." He's naming specific incidents that he's heard about, but coming to chapter six verse twelve he doesn't talk about any specific incidents anymore. So Paul is closing out his argument that he was calling, that he was saying from the first half where he heard specific reports of incidents that people were doing. And then the people of the church had written to Paul asking certain questions. They had doubts on doctrinal stances on certain things like marriage, what is like? What does sex, sex look like in marriage? And like all these different questions. And Paul is addressing them. And this section acts as a thematic transition between Paul calling the church out and Paul transitioning towards answering the questions of the people. So looking at verses, uh, so I'm going to read from 12 to 20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Verses 12 to 14 act as the introduction to the argument that Paul makes against sexual immorality. These, remember how I said earlier about the overarching theme being arrogance and pride, uh, elevated view of self. Paul is, t is quoting what they would say when they would engage in acts of um, sexual acts with prostitutes. So, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. So this is a reference to Romans chapter 7, verse 4, where he talks about we are liberated from the law. And that 
And the law does not hold binding over us anymore because Christ has died on the cross and we are therefore liberated from sin, from the law. But these people were abusing their Christian liberty by justifying their acts of promiscuity with prostitutes. If you notice, if you read 12 to 14, he in, the, in, in verse 12, he repeats, all things are lawful for me twice. He repeats for emphasis, but notice he says, but not all things are helpful. And in the next half, he says, but I will not be dominated by anything. He makes two different statements. He says, not all things are helpful. He says, okay, everything is lawful in Christ. You can do whatever. You have liberty to do it, but they're not always helpful. And in the next half, he says, you will not, but I will not be dominated by anything. He says, if you are dominated by a certain act, then you are in submission to that act. You are not in submission to God anymore. And moving on, verses 15 to 20 forms the bulk of our argument on against sexual immorality. And Paul uses this method of question and answer. He asks a question and then he answers the question. And he answers the question in a threefold statement, right? He says, in... So his answer consists of three things. One is a statement about a relationship with Christ. The other is a statement on a sexual relationship with a prostitute. And then a response on what you should have as a Christian against sexual immorality. So verse 15. So the, the argument goes parallelly in terms like he asks a question and then he lays out his responses. And then he asks the next question, and they all these three parallel go work in parallels with each other. Verse 15: Do you not know that you that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. And so in this uh, in this question, he says members of Christ. Obviously, he um, not obviously he's making a reference to Romans chapter 12, verse verses verses four to five, where he talks about being one in the body of Christ. He introduces this, uh, he says that when we are saved, we are all members of Christ, and therefore we are all in the body of Christ. So he's saying that if you are members of Christ, therefore, as therefore, can you then unite the members of Christ with that of a prostitute? Surely you cannot. And so the statement obviously about the relationship with Christ is that we are in the body of Christ. We are extensions of the body of Christ. And then about uh, sexual intercourse, he asks the question, do you then make the members of Christ a part of the prostitute? And the answer to the question is no. In the second question from verses 16 to 18, Paul asks, do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. This is a reference to Genesis chapter 2, verses 24, where God initially outlines the, um, a model for marriage. He says the man will leave his family, and then he will unite with his wife, and they will be together. And so he's saying that when you, act, when you engage in sexual intercourse with someone, you are, in, you are becoming one flesh. You are you, you're engaging in a union with them. And therefore, through that union, you are worshiping God. So if you engage in sexual intercourse with a prostitute, you are becoming one with the person. And, and then in verse 17, he goes on to say, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one in spirit with him. So in 15, he talks about being a, becoming a member of the physical body of Christ. In 17, he says, he talks about the spirit and how we are united in the spirit with God. And so in 18, he lays out his response saying, flee from sexual immorality. The verb usage of flee in that says urgency. And this is how our attitude towards this sin must be, that we should be urgent in acting on it. We should not let it grow on us, but we should flee from it as quick as we can. Continuing on in verse 18, he says, Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. 
in the first half of the statement, every other sin a person commits is outside the body, is something that the Corinthians used to say to justify their acts of promiscuity. They would say that all sins that I'm doing are outside the body. They did not realize if you're sexually immoral, you are sinning against your own body. And in verse 19, he concludes with the statement saying, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? within you whom you have from God so what his in this in verse 19 he connects back to 18 where he where he uh, talks about the body he's saying that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that is given to you by God and in 19 he goes on after the question he goes on to say you are not your own for you were bought with the price he is reiterating salvation here. He is saying that you were bought with the price. Your salvation did not come free. Someone had to die on a cross for you. Someone had to come down from heaven to walk this earth, to die on a cross so that you may be free and enter in communion with God. So realize the value of your salvation is what he's saying in this verse. He's saying you were bought with the price. And then he concludes verse 20 when he says, glorify God in your body. Now that's his, that's the conclusion of his exhortation when he says, glorify God in your body. He's saying, use your bodies to glorify God. And moving on, he's like, the, that is the statement that actually got me. He's saying, glorify God in your body. We always think like we glorify God through our acts in terms of like speech or doing good things to others in terms of helping them, but we don't realize that we can glorify God through our body by keeping it pure and undefiled. And this is a question I ask. It's, are you arrogant in using your Christian liberty? We, are, we know our limits and what we can and we cannot do, but people outside the world, people who are of the world, do not know what Christian liberty is. They are looking at you to actively see the witness that you are laying out in front of them. The second question is, are you active to flee from temptation? Are you active in fleeing when you encounter temptation of any form, not just sexual immorality? Sin from anything, sin against your own convictions. Are you ready to flee from that? Coming back, my friend Sam, the man who sat up front with the driver for 18 hours, when I first heard that story, that got me. That convicted me of my own sin in terms of how I had numbed my conscience and how I just lived in this sin and engaged with it. And in, he showed me the role model of fleeing when, it, when he was tempted. And because of he chose to flee, his classmates actually engaged in conversation about religion with him. These guys were Hindus, and they were asking him, why did you run away? Why did you leave when we started watching porn? And he explained to them that this was not how you engage in material. And he justified, he explained to them that it was sexually immoral for him to engage with that material, and therefore he left that scene because he couldn't bear to be there. And this is my application in the sense that fleeing from temptation, you can be a witness for God. And we see the Great Commission, Matthew 28, where God says, Go, therefore, make disciples of all people. If you take Dr. Park, you will know that she hates the word nations. <laughs> people. And so, therefore, this is a way that you set an example for the people. When you, active, when you are active in fleeing from what is causing you to be tempted by. Think of the Corinthian Christians. These, like not everyone was engaging, obviously, in this behavior. Think of those people who decided to say no to sexual temptation and said, I will remain pure in terms of, I will not engage in sexual acts outside of my marriage. I will not, if I am single, I will not engage in sexual acts that co compromise my my communion with Christ. So think of all these people and how they set an example. In Luke 12, verse 8, God tells us that, I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before, the, before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before angels of God. This is how much God is 
and God is happy by our choice of running away from this sin. Therefore, be witnesses of God and flee from sin. Thank you.